what is pronomian? And we've already mentioned Bonson. And so at the beginning of Bonson's book, which I have not read, by the way, I've not read by this standard. However, I have read the intro to it, his, his introduction. And in his introduction, he uses this term pronomian. He's the first one that I've found. And I could be wrong on this, but he's the first one that I've found that used, used the counter term to Luther's term antinomian. And what he says in that is interesting because he says that there are those who are antinomian who, uh, who like basically say, we're free in Christ to do whatever we want. Okay, but then you, he says, and then there's pro, those who are pronomian, and he gives a spectrum. And that spectrum is, you know, people who think that God's law is good for the believer all the way to people who believe that the sacrifices are still in act today. And so since Bonson is the first one to use the term, I think that we have to do some justice to his definition of it. Like we have to give some credence to his definition of it, even if it changes, right? So the way, so I understand that words can change, but one of the reasons that I think you know, there have been folks who want to make a movement, pronomianism or pronomian Christianity. And I think that that's where you and I are starting to push against. And I'll give you my reasoning first, and then you can tell me if you agree, disagree, or what your thoughts are in general. The reason that I think that it's a problem, I mean, I, I guess I just shoot it completely straight. The reason I think that it's a problem to try, try to make pronomian a, a movement like a pronomian Christianity or pronomianism is, is because we're going to have, if that is the case, we're going to have the same thing happen that we had happen with the Hebrew Roots movement. When somebody says, I'm Hebrew Roots, the first thing I think of are the major players of the 1990s and early 2000s, people like Michael Rood and Monty Judah. And I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but my point in saying those names is I don't necessarily agree with certain aspects of what they have taught. And so when somebody says, well, are you Hebrew roots? I, I automatically want to say no. And the reason why is because I don't want to be associated with those people. And I'm afraid that if we say, well, pronomian is, or pronomian Christianity is what we're going to have is a group of people over here who are defining it in a certain way. And then I'm not going to agree with that. So, Am I pronomian? Yeah, I'm pro law, but I think there's a sliding scale of what that is. Okay, and go. Um, yeah. So I, I think that I start, I said a little bit of this in that article about. Did you read any of that? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think there's naturally this desire for a lot of Christians who have been alienated. Um, they're wanting to keep some of the festivals they're, they, you know, they feel uncomfortable at their church because they don't eat pork and people do. And I've been there, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, sure. you know, when you're, you're at the church cookout and, you know, they're frying up some hot dogs and you're like, uh, are these beef? Know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 You know, um, just my camera here. Um, you know, I've been there. So they're looking for an identity and, and everybody has this natural inclination to want to be with people they share values and theology with. I mean, <clears throat> you know, there's a reason why if you go on um, Facebook, people organize these groups based on theology. They want to they want to have these discussions with people that believe similarly to themselves. And I think that um, because many of these people have oh, left their churches on Sunday and have decided to you know, keep the Sabbath and have decided to, you know, observe the dietary laws and various other things they're trying to find other people to do that. And they don't fit into any one category any longer. Right. Sure. Or at least they don't think they do. And so they're longing for a moniker to, to be able to describe what it is exactly that they believe. And, uh, for, for a while that was in some ways he roots, uh, until people find out that, there was just too much insanity associated with it, and they didn't want to be associated with that anymore. Right. And then you had the messianic and then they realized, man, I just want to be a Christian who keeps the laws. I'm not necessarily interested in some of the uh, Jewish culture, which there's nothing wrong with that. If that's your tradition, but um, they were wanting something that seemed more familiar to them and they wanted to just be able to keep the law. And so, you know, paranomia in the word itself as Bonson clearly has already used it. Right. 
and is it's obviously the antithesis of antinomian, which was used by Luther, it connects us to something historical within the Christian tradition. You don't feel like you have to be separate from the, the rest of Christianity. And so what has happened, I think, is they've taken a word that should just be a doctrine, right? Because sure. when I say I'm a pronomian, I mean that in the same way I might say that I am a uh, Calvinist, right? If you ask me, like, well, you know, what are you? What kind of Christian are you? Or like, who do you belong Like, what group are you with? I wouldn't sure. say I'm a, oh, I'm a Calvinist, right? Because that could be reformed. That could be, you know, you have to be in a reformed confessional church to be a Calvinist. There's lots of people that are Calvinists that aren't. Um, you know, you can be Presbyterian, whatever. Um, it's not, I, I'm not describing a set of doctrines. I'm describing something singular, right? And I think that that is how, unfortunately, they've taken this singular issue that doesn't mean anything more than um, one individual doctrine. And they're trying to attach all these other things to it so that they can have something that resembles denominationalism. And, yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've thought about two different questions recently. Because so just to kind of follow up your, what you were saying, like the, I, you know, there is a split even between maybe you and me in certain theologies like pedo baptism. OK, so I go to a church. I am a I don't know if I'd consider myself a member as of yet, but I'm a, my family attends a church that is a that they practice pedo baptism. Now, we are not pedo baptists. But what I see some people attempting to do, and this isn't a down on those people, I understand it just like you've kind of described, we we naturally want to fit into these groups, you know, we want to attract people around us, so this isn't a dig on anybody, but the, it's like saying, trying to make pronomian a, into a sect or into a denomination or into a, a movement or whatever you want to say is kind of like saying, well, we're pedo baptists you know, like it's it's like trying to take that one issue and make it into the the focal point issue. Now, I understand that the law, obviously, as someone who loves the law and is trying to learn the law and live out the law, I understand that this is a central issue for many people and why it's a central issue. I think that every Christian, no matter if they consider themselves pronomian or not, at some point has to deal with the fact that they that obviously the Bible is the standard. And that leads me to my the other thing that I've kind of been working through. Like, there's such a, a wide spectrum of what pronomian could be, and so I've thought about the idea of could a Catholic be pronomian? And the reason why is because ultimately, I I've waffled back and forth on this, and I'll I, I guess I'm kind of asking you your thoughts on this. And the reason why I've waffled back and forth on this is not because I don't think that a Catholic can. Someone and let's say Roman Catholic. It's not that I don't think a Roman Catholic can say I want to keep the Sabbath on on Saturday, as opposed to what the Catholic Church does, or I want to keep a kosher diet. Certainly, a Roman Catholic can do that and believe that. But ultimately, I think that the way that I've kind of thought of pronomian in my own way is that the the law of God is the standard by which we are interpreting things and the way that I've understood Roman Catholicism is that, no, the, the councils are also brought into like, you know, uh, almost man-made. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to down anyone, but obviously the councils are not the standard above or at the same level as the, as God's law. And so that's why I've kind of flip flopped back and forth on Roman Catholicism. I know this has gotten into a weird place, but it's just kind of something that I've, you know, just working through the ideas of what is pronomianism or what is the, the, the theology of pronomian, I don't want to exclude anyone in terms of it's not an exclusion. It's not an exclusionary. It's not a club. That's I guess that's what I'm getting at. You know what I mean? It's not a club like you're in and you're out. Right. And so I guess the, the question that I'm trying to ask you is how big of a sliding scale can the term pronomian encompass? It's very broad. I mean, I mean, the, the reality is, is that the only thing that pronomia really means is that the God's law is still relevant for Christians today. I mean, that's it. Because I mean, antinomian in and of itself was there were people historically that have completely discounted the law. And in many cases, the, even the entirety of the Old Testament. And it said the only thing that matters now is the New Testament. But we're saying, no, that's not the only thing that matters. All of the, the entire scope of God's wisdom 
in the scripture is relevant to us today. It, it isn't even a statement about how it matters, right? Because, um, you know, there are people out there that believe it matters in various different ways. So an example you have is somebody like um, Jeff Durbin or Doug Wilson, who they're theonomists, and they think that God's civil law matters, God's moral law matters, but that the aspects of what they would uh, call ceremonial is irrelevant. And, and they put some other things under that ceremonial category that I wouldn't agree with, but um, th those things are irrelevant. And, uh, but those people are definitely pronomian, right? Because they believe God's law has applicability today. They believe that Paul was deferring to God's law um, to develop doctrine. That's pronomian. Now, you're going to have people within people that think, hey, you know what, we should keep the passer. Great. But but then you have groups out there that still believe that you should still slaughter a lamb on Passover. Right. Which which you and I would say no. Right. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And um, now between me and you and the person that thinks they should slaughter the lamb on Passover and then Jeff Durbin, we all have a view that the law is still relevant. But we think there are certain contingencies therein that make um, its applicability uh, translate differently into our given context. Okay. And so, but that's sort of an irrelevancy because the reality is, is that we all believe that it still matters. We just, what we're now quibbling over are the contingencies. Sure. Right. The contingencies therein. And so I think that there need to be certain distinctions made. And as, as doctrine develops with regard to, with re, regard to pronomianism, there needs to be these, some of these contingencies need to be spelled out. And um, I think it's really important. Like, you know, we look at like dietary laws. Well, why aren't those ceremonial? Yeah. You know, and I, so I think some of those things need to be hashed out. I think that um, when we're talking about when, when many of the people that I know are identifying as pronomian or talking about pronomianism, what they're really referring to is, what I'm calling Old Testament sacramentalism, right? Oh, it's not even me calling it. Like that's a that's just a purely historical word that Puritans have used for a long time. But Old Testament sacramentalism, and um, they believe that the festivals are still relevant to us today. And in some Christians today, we just sort of observe Pentecost at sure. um, at my church here, and um, they don't think the festivals are necessarily um, still necessary apparently they do still think that Pentecost is necessary. So in right. some ways they are holding to a, a version of that. Um, so I, again, that's where I think that it's, it's, we've got to be a bit more careful in how we're framing it. And I think we need to look at the different ways in which pronomianism can take form. So that way we're not, like you said, because here's the thing, no matter what we say, we can try to, we can try to monopolize this term and we can try to say, Hey, this is we're appropriated for ourselves. No one's going to let us do that. All you're going to do is recategorize uh, yourself under the Hebrew roots or crazy banner of <laughs> theology. That's all you're going to do. Uh, right. No Christian is going to let you just appropriate the term pronomian and say, hey, this all this now this means for sure that you have to keep the Passover. It's like there are pronomian people that do not believe that. So we need to develop doctrine out to say, hey, what falls under the umbrella of pronomianism? And quit making it on our quit making it our entire identity. You know, there are other people like Jeff Durbin and Doug Wilson who would call themselves pronomian, but they're not, I mean, uh, Doug Wilson, actually, I'm part of the same denomination of Doug Wilson, um, is going to tell you he's a Presbyterian. Sure. Um, you know, because Presbyterianism represents an entire section, an entire set of doctrine, a doctrine. Um, sorry, I'm stumbling over my words there, but there's something else you had said. I wanted to ask, throw out to you and see what your thoughts were here. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was now. You'd said, um, oh, yeah, you were talking about um, what pronomian means. And I, I think if you look at something like the Hebrew roots, and this is the danger we run into, and I want to see what your, your thoughts are here. The words Hebrew roots, okay, because some people are kind of making a simplistic argument. It's like pronomian means for law. So, you know, I'm not misusing the term by adding uh, by trying to appropriate it this way. And I'm, uh, when, especially when you put it with the word Christian, right? A okay, pro law Christian. 
Right. Um, well, Hebrew roots in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with it. If you actually just look at what the words mean, no one's going to, if, if let's remove Hebrew roots movement out of the context, 50 years ago, if you'd said, Hey, let's get back to the, uh, I, I, we need to understand the Hebrew roots of the scripture. Most scholars would agree with you. It's a, yeah, that's a good exegetical way of approaching the text. It's taking on its own identity, however. Right. So I guess what, do you, what are your concerns as far as, and you kind of started to list them, people that are uh, of different theologies taking this on as their sole identity. Do you think that it's going to run the same risk that the word Hebrew roots did in that people are going to take that, they're going to sort of taint it. And even though the word itself is good and it means something specific, they're going to take that on themselves and make it mean something else entirely just based off of their own behavior and their own way in which they're identifying with it. Yeah. I think that one of the things that I've seen in the Hebrew roots movement, and this is, you know, people back to what you said, I think it's a a real point, like a a real important point that we want to make groups. Okay. That, that agree with, like we want to make a group of people that we agree with. And so what we see happening, like, and I'm sorry to continue to use the Hebrew roots movement, but I think it's, it's because we're, we've been so close to it. What we see happening in the Hebrew roots movement is that people are willing to fudge on doctrines that they that they believe in and that they want to uphold, and they'll share community and share the stage with people on on doctrines that they don't think are foundational. And that's fine. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. That's totally fine. But all of a sudden, what you have is you have this mixed bag, this huge mixed bag of theology. And so now all of a sudden you say, well, I'm, you know, if somebody says, well, I'm Hebrew roots, if somebody goes online and and searches Hebrew roots, they come up with all these doctrines that I have no association with. In fact, I'd condemn those doctrines as, as not biblical at all. And we're already starting to see this a little bit within uh, people who are attempting to build a, you know, a movement or a denomination or whatever it may be out of the term pronomian. And that is that we have things like, I mean, you and I disagree with, with egalitarianism. That's, I mean, I think that that's kind of a hotbed issue within, you know, among people our age right now is this idea of, of egalitarianism. Well, I'm never going to, I would never be part of a denomination that ordains women as ministers. I just, that's, I don't see that as biblical. Now, somebody's going to say to me, well, that is not a foundational issue. Okay, it's not a foundational issue in terms of salvation, right? I agree that it's not a salvation issue. However, for the church that I'm going to be a part of, that is a foundational issue. I'm not going to sit under, you know, under a elder board that that is ordaining women. I just don't that so in other words, it becomes foundational. It's those kind of issues to me that I see as like, I don't, you know, if all of a sudden pronomian becomes a movement in there and the majority of people are saying, yeah, we're egalitarian, I'm going to have to distance myself from that. And so that, that to me is a, that's a major, you know, those are some of the major kind of things that would make me disassociate, which is why I want to maintain simply a, a theological term. And this goes back to like pedo baptism and that, that kind of stuff. Ultimately, I think that what we are seeing is that the term pronomian, and you've talked a little bit about, you know, the Luther's antinomianism and Bonson using this term, it, it, what that does is it actually centers this term within Christianity, right? I mean, we can say that the Jews, the non-believing Jews are pronomian because obviously they're pro-law, but ultimately the term pronomian is coming into Christianity because we have this, this anti-term, which is antinomianism. So, it, you know, it, it squares it within theology. But the fact is, is that Luther is the one who uses the term antinomian, and he's, well, I mean, we, what, what should we call him, a Lutheran? Right. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. weird to try to think about that, but you know, ultimately let's call him a Lutheran for now. And then Bonson, I think Bonson, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong on this, but I think Bonson is more uh, in the Presbyterian vein of things. Okay. So now you have two coming into the term, you have two different denominations of Christianity that are being represented. 
And whether or not we agree with those denominations or not, that's beside the point. Now, all of a sudden, we have the those within maybe Messianic Judaism and the Hebrew Roots Movement who are saying, yeah, I, I agree with pronomianism. And so now you have like two other groups that are being joined to this. So we really have this huge kind of array of Christian doctrine where this this term applies to all of all all of four of those of those beliefs and certainly you're going to have people within pentecostalism and and other things so i think that it, what we see just naturally is this word applying as a theology not as a movement and i think that that i think that we we have to retain that otherwise it's going to get tainted for people yeah yeah i agree i mean it's kind of like i i was actually uh speaking with somebody yesterday and i think that you look at something like the word catholic and uh so my family and i we do a um we do a family liturgy on a rev spot right on, on uh, sabbath eve and we read through some prayers and so we one thing we've been doing is we've been reciting the uh, apostles creed and uh, we've been singing it together as a family so with my children and um there's a point at the end if anybody is familiar with the apostles creed um where it talks about i believe in one holy catholic church right okay now me representing uh, understanding what that kind of means and represents to people right. no okay there's going to be people that are going to hear this and they're going to interpret that to mean roman catholicism right all right so what I did in my, my liturgy is I put a footnote that says this is not a reference to the Roman Catholic Church. This is actually comes from a Greek word um, and kind of had to like explain that it, it kind of it's the universality of the word Catholic, that it means all believers in essence. Right. And um, and sure enough, <laughs> I've had people at my house with, that have gone through this with us. And we got to that part and they, I get, I see them get quiet and I, I look over and I can see them reading the footnotes. <laughs> right. Yes. And yeah. the point being there is that <laughs> the word Catholic doesn't have any negative. Uh, right. it, it, there's nothing negative about the word Catholic. It's actually good. And most people would agree with the pure definition of the word Catholic. However, because it does represent the identity of a group, Roman Catholicism, if you were to ask me, you know, what do you believe about the church? I said, well, you know, I'm a Catholic. The very first thing you're going to think of is, oh, okay, I'm part of the Catholic denomination. So what can happen is because a group can take on a word as an identity, that word becomes so intrinsically tied to that group. You can't even use it anymore without, without it um, automatically. And nobody, I, I almost guarantee you, nobody that you know, I would say almost nobody. I, I, I haven't met anybody that when you ask them their beliefs um, or they ask them what their ecclesiology is, they get the first thing that comes out is, well, I'm a Catholic because they just already know how it's going to be received and interpreted. Right. And so, uh, you know, I think that we run that same risk. If we take it out of the realm of doctrine and make it a group identifier, it will, it is just a matter of time before people will stop using it because it's only going to identify a single group of people. And mind you, a single group of people, it would be one thing if they had that, like entire, all these different doctrines and it would became, and they were like, you know, the United Pronomian Church of America. I don't know, something like that. It'd be, they'd be a clear organization, institution, because I'm a pronomian, but I'm not part of that group. Um, but when you're trying to make that single word a representative of, of, of your group and, and people are going to distance themselves from it just naturally. And uh, I, I share your same concerns. Um, I, I share your con same concerns and, and you're right. I mean, just between me and you, between me and Josh Inslee, who's, a, who's who also identifies the book of word and, and me and other people that I've seen identifying it, there's a vast, vast uh, David Wilbur who also identifies with the word prune. Pr I mean, I, uh, David Wilber's a, a brother, Lord. I, uh, I like, I love him a lot, but he and I disagree on a lot of things, Sure, you know, and, and I'd say the same about you and me. I'd say the same yeah. about you and me. Yeah. I, I think that we disagree on, a, on a lot of, <laughs> a lot of different doctrine, but I think that we share uh, a lot of doctrine as well. But, uh, to me, and I think that that's kind of the beauty of 
of theological terms instead of movement terms. You know, and back just real quick back to what you were saying. If if somebody wanted to say, well, you know, I'm part of the first pronomian Presbyterian of you of, of the United States denomination. You've listed a number of th- like if that's going to be your group's name, okay, fair enough. But just to say something like, well, I'm, you know, I'm part of pronomianism or I'm part I am a pronomian Christian. Once again, that does nothing for us. It, it really do, it doesn't help. Um, you know, if I say, well, I'm part of the, you know, I'm, I'm a pronomian Baptist. Now, all of a sudden we're starting to, yeah. now we're starting to hone in. Right. Mm-hmm. And if I, if I have a church that I go to and I say, well, I'm part of the pronomian first Baptist church. Okay. Now we've attached it to something which gives more outliers and people, you know, one of the, one of the things that I've seen a lot recently is, Oh, we don't need another name. We don't need another name. And it's like, well, you know, this is what we have denominational names for is to kind of center where we believe you consider yourself more Presbyterian. I consider myself more Baptist and that actually helps, doesn't it? Because when you say I'm Presbyterian, I instantaneously know a certain a certain trajectory of where you're coming from. And when I say, well, I'm a Baptist, you know, people are going to say, well, you're not part of the 1689 Baptist Confederate. You know, it's like, well, okay, but you know at least where I'm coming from, even if I disagree with some of the main doctrines of, you know, this group over here or whatever. So I think, yeah, I I think the fact that there's a deep sigh when you ask people that are for the law, what they're (laughs) like, what they believe means we need another name. You know, like if somebody's like, Hey, what, what is it? So, Oh, you keep the password. So what is it you believe? And you're like, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. so like, <laughs> you know, like the fact that that exists means we need another name. Cause up to this point, the only thing we can come up with is, is Hebrew roots and, and messianic. And I'm just not either of those things. Right. Just, exactly. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, the fact that I need a shorthand way. And I remember, I remember the first time I used the word, um my friend's like so are you a christian i'm like yeah totally he's like well what, what would you how would you define this that you believe and i said um i'd say i'm pronomian you know because we'd had conversations about antinomianism so i'm pronomian and man it was no questions asked didn't think about it he didn't have he's like i i get that and that was it and um right. that was the, that was it it was just it's just a shorthand way of saying i'm for the law right now Again, you're going to have people that disagree. Even theonomists have different, but there's different ranges of how the civil law applies. They don't all agree on how the civil law applies, but it's it's just this. It's a starting premise. It's a starting premise that says, "Hey, I have not discounted the law. I have not discounted the law." You're not going to find a word that's going to it's going to encompass every nuance of doctrine. It just right. isn't going to happen within Calvinism. There are different kinds of Calvinists within. Uh, car, uh, complementarianism, there's different kinds of comp- you know, all these different di- variations of words. You know, these words are not intended to cover every nuance of doctrine, they're intended to be a shorthand way of expressing a concept. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly from that, we just have to figure out now how do we understand the law? How when we say this is the premise that the law is good, Old Testament sacramentalism is it something? that we still need to be concerned with? Is it something that we that, that ha- holds some relevancy to See, our life? The, Should I be looking at the feast? But, you know? but what you're talking about is exactly what, what I like about terms like that, is that when I say something, and let's take it out of the, the term pronomian, let's put it into, you've used the word Calvinist. Okay, that's let's use that word. I was having dinner at my house with a group of believers, I don't know, a month ago. And somebody said, well, uh, you know, I've just started studying Calvinism. And the problem that I have is that God essentially damns people to hell. And I said, okay, well, what you're talking about is often referred to as four-point Calvinism instead of five-point Calvinism, because that's the one sticking. And this opens up a huge conversation, right? So just the term Calvinism, no, like we, none, we, none of us really agreed at the table on all of the five points of Calvinism. But at the same time, what it did was it squared our conversation so that we could actually talk about those differences. And ultimately, that's what pronomian needs to be as well. We need to be able to say, well, I'm pronomian. Oh, well, I am too. 
So what do we mean by that? Like, well, I don't believe that the law, you know, the civil law still applies today. Well, I do. Okay, well, you know, so it's being able to open up those conversations instead of saying, well, I'm pronomian. Oh, well, I totally disagree with that movement. You know what I mean? Anyway. All right, man. Good conversation. I think that uh, I think that does it. You got anything else you want to talk about? No, no, no. I I liked it. It was good. I I think what I'll do is I'll probably chop it up into like bite-sized little five-minute bits or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, if you want to, we can put the whole